Section 8.1 Sequences. First of all, let's make the definition a sequence of real numbers is really a function whose domain is, let's say, a subset of the natural numbers. That is the natural number set consisting of all of our counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So for example, what I mean by this is if we took the function 1 over x and we restricted the domain to only positive integer values, so x equals 1, x equals 2, and so on, then of course what we get for output values would be a set that would look like 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, and so on. Okay, in that case what we've produced is a discrete list of values, which is what we're calling a sequence. So we begin with some formula. We restrict the inputs for that formula or that function to strictly positive integer values. When we evaluate the function at those positive integer values, we get a discrete list of numbers. That's our sequence. Notationally, we reserve a special notation for sequences. So when we have a sequence like, let's use our example of 1 over x, where x is restricted to the natural numbers, we normally like to replace that x with an n to remind us that the values we're plugging in are only integer values. Instead of using function notation like f of n, it's normal to take a lowercase letter and put a little subscript beside it, where that subscript is the same variable or relates to the same variable that we're using in the formula. So in this case, I would define this sequence by this formula. This is the formula that defines each element or each member in the sequence and if I take that a sub n and I put it inside a pair of squiggly braces this is meant to denote the sequence in its entirety. So if I write a sub n equals 1 over n. I take that to be the formula that tells me how to find a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, and so on. And so if I ask what is the fifth number in this sequence, which would be the fifth number in that list, I would simply use this formula and get 1 fifth. If I write a sub n inside a pair of squiggly braces, then of course I'm referring to the entire sequence. That is the entire list, one, one half, one third, one fourth, etc. Based on this definition, uh, one thing is clear two sequences, let's say the sequence a sub n and the sequence b sub n, are equal if and only if a sub n and b sub n are equal for each value of n. And that seems like kind of a trivial statement, but we're just asserting what it means for two sequences to be equal. For two lists, infinite lists of numbers, like these two sequences, we're going to consider them equal if and only if they match up in every spot the first spot, second spot, third spot, and so on. So notice a quick example. If we define a sub n to be 1 over n, which again was our sequence 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, and so on, and I define b sub n to equal negative 1 to the n over n, 
Uh, both of these two are sequences we're going to use a lot. Uh, notice what this sequence looks like. When n is 1, this is negative 1. When n is 2, this is 1 half. When n is 3, this is negative 1 third. And so we're getting the 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, but the signs are alternating uh, term by term. Okay, so obviously, even though there's a strong relation between these two sequences, these sequences are not equal because in those odd index terms, that is the first term in the sequence, the third, the fifth, and seventh, those terms don't match. So in this case, I would say that a sub n is not the same sequence as b sub n. Okay, since a sequence is an infinite list of numbers, the next natural question would be to ask, can we take limits of a sequence to see if that list of numbers is trending toward any particular limit? So definition will say the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals L if given epsilon greater than zero there is some cap n greater than zero such that if and I do want n now is greater than that cap n then a sub n minus l is less than epsilon and this definition shouldn't come as a surprise for you it's the same definition that we had in Calc 1 for limit as x approaches infinity of a function f of x equals L. We said that that simply meant that eventually if this was the horizontal asymptote y equals L, that if that limit as x approaches infinity was L, there was some number n such that if we went beyond that n, all function values would be close to L as close as we wanted them to be. So if this top green line was L plus epsilon and this bottom green line was Y equals L minus epsilon, then if X greater than N implies that F of X minus L is less than epsilon, that's simply saying that once we pass this n, all of these function values have to be in between these two green lines. That means they're staying as close to y equals l as we want them to be. And of course, this definition above is the same thing except for sequences. Now our picture looks like this. If we're saying the limit is l, then it means when I'm given an epsilon, If I look at L minus epsilon, let's say that's that line, and I look at L plus epsilon, we're saying that if the limit of the sequence really is L, there should be some n value so that once I pass that n value with my little n, so if that big n was 1,000, then when n is 1,001, 1,002, and so on, then all the points or numbers in my sequence should fall within the green band. That is the band that falls between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. What happens if I make this epsilon smaller? Then probably this N has to get bigger. So let's look at a quick example of how to verify a limit using this definition. So let's say we wanted to verify that the limit as n approaches infinity of the sequence n over 2n plus 1 is equal to 1 half. Um, what we'd want to show then, now this is the proof, I'm just sketching out what I need to show by the definition. I need to show that if I'm given an arbitrary epsilon greater than 0, then there is some n value 
greater than zero such that if my little n is sufficiently large, larger than that cap n, then the members or numbers in my sequence are within epsilon of one half. Now, of course, if you think about how you used to work these in Calc 1, one simple thing I could do is simply start with this statement and work backwards. So if I look at n over 2n plus 1 minus 1 half less than epsilon, which of course is equivalent to 2n minus 2n minus 1 over 2 times 2n plus 1. which is equivalent to, well, the numerator would be negative 1, and when I take the absolute value, that would be 1. The bottom would be the absolute value of 2 times 2n plus 1. And I know that for positive integer values of n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, that that denominator is positive. So there's no need for the absolute value now. This, of course, is the same thing as saying 1 over 2n plus 1 is less than 2 epsilon. If I reciprocate both sides, which are both positive, I get 2n plus 1 is greater than 1 over 2 epsilon, which is the same thing as saying 1 over 2 epsilon minus 1 over 2 is less than n. And if I clean that up a little bit, that's the same thing as saying 1 minus 2 epsilon over 4 epsilon is less than or n, or to say that the other way, n is greater than 1 minus 2 epsilon over 4 epsilon. All right, so this is how large little n would have to be to guarantee that this is happening. That is that my sequence member is staying within epsilon of the proposed limit one half. And now we've determined that if n is larger than this value, so this becomes the big N in our definition. Now, there will be simpler ways to find <coughs> limits shortly, uh, just like there were with all limits we took in Calc 1. But of course, all other things that we do with limits spring from this basic definition. So a very useful theorem for finding limits of sequence is the following. If f of x is continuous on, let's say, the interval 1 to infinity, and f of n equals a sub n, where a sub n is some sequence function, for each positive integer value of n, so n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, and the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals l, then we can say the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is also L. And we won't prove this here, but the idea is if a function had a limit of L, so let's say that's y equals L, and let's say as x approaches infinity, then the limit is L means we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals L. Then, of course, what that says is if that function f of x and the sequence a sub n match up at all integer values, meaning if this is 1 and this is 2 and this is 3 and this is 4 and so on, then the members of the sequence a sub n just happen to match up with the continuous function f of x. Well, if the continuous function trends toward y equals l in the limit sense, 
then this sequence of values, this discrete sequence, will also tend to that same limit of y equals l. That should seem plausible. Uh, the continuity of the function guarantees essentially that in between each pair of integer values, the function can't deviate and do anything strange. So for example, between 3 and 4, um, if these are the two points, let me do those in, let's say, purple. So if that's a sub 3 and that's a sub 4, continuity of the function says that the blue graph of f of x uh, won't take off and do something wild in between 3 and 4, like approach a vertical asymptote or the like. So continuity guarantees that to get from a sub 3 to a sub 4, that trend is going to have to mimic what's happening with the actual function f of x. And that's the idea of the theorem. And what this means, for example, is with our early, or earlier problem of limit n goes to infinity of n over 2n plus 1, um, n over, sorry, n over 2n plus 1. What we're saying is we can actually replace that with a continuous limit of the continuous function x over 2x plus 1. And of course, in that case, we recognize immediately that L'Hopital's rule applies as this is an infinite limit in the top, and the bottom is also infinite, so this is infinity over infinity form. Applying L'Hopital's, I would get limit as x approaches infinity of the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom, which would be 1 half. Now, in practice, when I use this continuous limit concept to find the limit of a sequence, I don't formally have to go through rewriting the limit in terms of an x, as long as it's understood that the reason I can do this in the discrete case is because of this theorem. Basically what I'm doing is replacing this discrete sequence with a continuous function, and that continuous function just happens to match the sequence at these inputs of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And if they do match and the function is continuous and the limit of your function exists, then the limit of the sequence is that same number. Okay, which of course greatly reduces or simplifies finding limits of sequences. It just reduces it to finding limits of continuous functions. Okay, let's look at a few more definitions to get some basic concepts under our belts. Uh, the next one we want to talk about is the concept of the subsequence. So let's say a sub n is a sequence. Then I'm going to define a sub n sub k, so that's a double subscript there. The n is a subscript on the a and then the k is a subscript on the n. I'm going to say a sub n sub k is a subsequence of the sequence a sub n. And this simply means that for k equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, the sequence n sub 1, n sub 2, n sub 3, and so on, is a subset of the natural number set. Okay, so for example, if our original sequence, a sub n, which of course consists of a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, a sub 4, and so on, then let's say when k is 1, I will get a number n sub 1. When k is 2, I'll get a number n sub 2, and so on. Uh, up to, let's say, k is 100, there'll be an n sub 100. Okay, the only thing we're saying when we build a subsequence is we're going to take some 
of these original values in the sequence, and we're going to keep just some of them. Perhaps all of them, but a subsequence does mean a subset. So for example, this n sub 1 could actually be 2. This n sub 2 could be 5. Um, n sub 3 could be 8. Okay, what that means is I'm now looking at the sequence a sub 2, a sub 5, a sub 8, and then whatever the rest of these n sub k numbers are. So I'm using the k index as a natural counter to say that this will give me the first element in the subsequence, this will give me the second, and so on. The n just tells me that I'm referring to this original sequence I started with. So if a sub n is the entire sequence, a sub n sub k is just a part of that sequence, where the k tells me which member of the sequence I'm on, first, second, third, fourth, etc. And the n just tells me that I'm taking a subsequence of this original a sub n. So, for example, if we had this sequence, a sub n, where a sub n equals 1 over n, so that same one that we've talked about before, of course I know that that sequence looks like 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, and so on. Okay, I could define the sequence a sub n sub k, where let's say a sub n sub k equals one over two k minus one. Okay, notice that would give me when k is one, I'm going to get one. When k is two, which would be the second number in the subsequence, I'm going to get 1 over 4 minus 1, I'm going to get 1 third. When k is 3, which would be the third number in this subsequence, I'm going to get 1 fifth. Okay, if you can see what I'm doing there, I'm just picking out the odd indexed terms in the original sequence. And by the way, if I haven't said that already, this little variable that I'm using to track which number in the sequence I'm on is often called the index. And so what we can say for this new subsequence is that k is the index that's controlling whether I'm on the first term, second term, or third term. And notice that I am using the k now in this formula to generate the subsequence I'm after. So in this case, a sub n was the sequence of these reciprocal numbers one, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, and so on. A sub n sub k, as I've defined it here, is just the subsequence of the odd index terms from the original sequence, which are those fractions where the denominator is an odd number. Um, obviously, I could create a subsequence where a sub n sub k is 1 over 2k. And of course, for that one, if k is 1, I'm going to get 1 half. If k is 2, I'm going to get 1 fourth. If k is 3, I'm going to get 1 sixth. And obviously, that is the other subsequence of the even one. So the next one in that list would be 1 sixth, and then 1 eighth, and then 1 tenth. So this is what we mean by subsequences, and it's, it's exactly what you think it would be. It's taking the sequence and keeping sum of the terms. Of course, we're still talking about an infinite sequence, so a subsequence still has an infinite number of terms. It's just a selection or subset of the terms in the original sequence. Okay, an important theorem. The limit is n goes to infinity of a sub n equals l. Now, before we write out the theorem, this would be the time to throw in a couple of other little pieces of lingo we use about sequences. So, of course, this means that the limit of this sequence is l. 
Um, a shorthand way that we write that sometimes is to say a sub n with an arrow and then an L. So that shorthand for the sequence a sub n converges to L. And notice using that word converges that I just used, I would call this a convergent sequence. So those are all interchangeable. When I say the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n equals l, the shorthand for that is a sub n approaches l. That is, the numbers in that sequence are getting closer to l, or staying closer to l. And in that case, I would call this a convergent sequence. Our theorem is going to say that if a sequence is convergent, that happens if and only if, let's say, every subsequence of a sub n also converges to that same limit. To, so understand the importance of that statement. It's saying if the limit of a sequence exists, if this sequence converges, then every possible subsequence that you could construct from that sequence also has to converge to that same limit. Conversely, if every subsequence, if it can be demonstrated that every possible subsequence of a sequence converges to L, then that entire sequence has to converge to L. Now, a special case of this theorem, that, uh, and it's really the only one that we might make use of, so I'll just say special case. So let's say if a sequence can be partitioned into exactly two subsequences, and it can be shown that both of these subsequences converge to the same limit. then the limit of a sub n sequence will be the same number. And a pair of subsequences that we like to use quite a bit are these two. If a sub n is the sequence, then I can look at the subsequence a sub 2n minus 1, and I can look at the subsequence a sub 2n. And notice here if I make a chart of n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, you can see that I'm using this expression in the index to control how I'm building the subsequence. So for example, when n is 1, 2, 3, 4, the original sequence looks like a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, a sub 4, the complete sequence. When n is 1, 2n minus 1 is 1. When n is 2, 2 times 2 minus 1 is a sub 3. When n is 3, that'll be a sub 5. When n is 4, that'll be a sub 7. Look at the a sub 2n. When n is 1, that's a sub 2. When n is 2, that's a sub 4. When n is 3, that's a sub 6, and then a sub 8. This is obviously the subsequence of odd index terms from the original sequence. And this is obviously the subsequence of terms from the original sequence, which had even indices. a sub 2, a sub 4, a sub 6, a sub 8, and so on. And what our little theorem is saying is, 
Well, in this example, we've managed to partition this entire sequence into two, let's say, interleaving subsequences, because obviously this is, if I'm following the entire sequence, a sub 1, then a sub 2, then a sub 3, then a sub 4, then a sub 5, then a sub 6, and so on. But the theorem says if these two both converge to the same limit, then I could make the conclusion that the original sequence in its entirety also converges to the same limit. And so theoretically, uh, if you study advanced calculus, uh, it turns out that sequences are the underpinning of much of what we do in calculus. And this idea of subsequential limits all having to equal the same thing in order for the entire sequence to have a limit is an important concept. Uh, the only use we may make of it here is really this little example I've given you. That is this concept of partitioning the sequence into these two special subsequences. The odd ones, that is the ones that had odd indices, and the even ones. Okay, let's have another definition now. We're just trying to uh, get through the important preliminaries here about sequences. So we'll say the sequence a sub n is a non-decreasing sequence. If a sub n plus 1 is greater than or equal to a sub n for all valid n values. And of course what that would say here is that a sub 1 is less than or equal to a sub 2 is less than or equal to a sub 3 and so on. And of course when we say non-decreasing, the first thing we think is increasing, which of course is what it looks like here. As the index values increase, the terms in the sequence, well, we're saying they're non-decreasing because with that or equal to on each one of those inequalities, either the members in the sequence are getting bigger or they're staying the same. Now, we will add that if A1 is strictly less than A2, is strictly less than A3, is strictly less than 4, and so on, i.e., a sub n is strictly less than a sub n plus 1 for all n. Then we'll say the sequence is strictly increasing. Notice another way to say that is that we could say the sequence is monotone increasing. Remember from chapter 6, monotonic meant strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. So if I remove those equal twos, and I know that the numbers in the sequence are strictly larger, when I go to each successive term, we'll say that it's monotone increasing or strictly increasing. Uh, similarly, we can talk about a sub n being a non-increasing sequence. If a sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to a sub n, that is the terms in the sequence are not getting bigger. And similarly, if a sub n is strictly greater than a sub n plus 1, we have a monotone decreasing sequence. Some more definitions. Upper and lower bounds. Okay, definition. 
the number m is an upper bound. That is two words, upper bound, for a set A if, well, of course, upper bound means what? Nothing is larger than that number. So that means everything in the set is less than or equal to that number. So I'm going to say M is an upper bound for that set if X is less than or equal to that M for all values in that set. So first of all, m being an upper bound simply means that it is a point which no number in the set can go above. It's a ceiling. m is a, and now this is an important definition, a least upper bound for a if two things. Number one, M is an upper bound. And two, if X is less than or equal to U, let's say for all X in the set, then m has to be less than or equal to u, i.e., m is the smallest upper bound for the numbers in the set A. So if I thought about a number line, I realize these numbers or these bounds we're talking about are real numbers. And we are talking about upper bounds for a set of real numbers, so we can picture this on the number line. So if I said M was an upper bound, then that means what? Any numbers in my set A, whatever this set is that we're talking about, they would all be below M on the number line, so they'd all be here. Okay, now, if I say M is a least upper bound, that means what? It means if u was some other upper bound for the numbers in this set. So suppose there's another u such that all the numbers in that set fall below u. Well, there's two places that u could be. It could be up here, or it could be down here somewhere. Well, you should notice there's, there's a problem with it being down here. If you say that that number is an upper bound for the numbers in the set A, it means all of the numbers in the set fall below that U. If that's the case, then it was a poor choice to call this number a least upper bound for the set. It's clearly not the smallest number, because if I can force all of the numbers in the set to be smaller than U, then this is not really the least upper bound. It is an upper bound in the sense that all of these numbers are definitely less than m, but I was able to come up with a tighter bound that is something smaller. Now, the least upper bound is the smallest one that you can possibly find. Okay, notice a consequence of this. If m was truly the least upper bound, so suppose that really is the least upper bound. And you pick any other number u that's smaller than m. Well, if m is the least upper bound, it means it is the smallest number that's an upper bound for every number in the set. That means this u number cannot be an upper bound for every number in the set. There could be some numbers in the set less than u, but there would have to be some more in between u and m that are bigger than u while still being smaller than m. If that wasn't true, m would not be the smallest upper bound. All right, so we can formalize that. Let's say that given epsilon greater than zero, so epsilon meaning some small number, and that suppose m 
is the least upper bound, so that's what my LUB stands for, least upper bound of the set A. We can definitely say that M minus epsilon is not an upper bound for A. Again, if this is M on the number line, M minus epsilon would be a little bit smaller. If this is truly the least upper bound, it means it is the smallest number on the number line below which all of the numbers in my set fall. Okay, that means this one can't be a least upper bound because if it was, again, all the numbers in my set would be below M minus epsilon. If I'm saying this is the least upper bound, it means this one, which is smaller, can't be an upper bound. That means there must be some numbers in here that are in the set A. So what I can say is there must be at least one x value from the set A such that x is greater than m minus epsilon. That is, there has to be at least some number here that is in the set A. If there wasn't, then this m minus epsilon would be the upper bound for the set. But we know that's not true because we're claiming that big M is the smallest upper bound for the entire set. We have a similar definition for lower bounds. We'll say M is a lower bound for a set A. Well, of course, what do I mean by lower bound? I mean, if that's M, I mean it's the bottom, and everything in the set has to be above it. So I'll say M is a lower bound for a set A if X is greater than or equal to M for all X in the set. And we'll say M is a greatest lower bound if two things, so similar to our definition before. Number one, of course, M is a lower bound for A. And two, If L is any lower bound for A, then L must be less than or equal to M. So again, if this is M, and we're saying that's an upper bound, then of course, on its face, that says that all the numbers in our set are above M. If I said L was some other lower bound, then of course, again, there are two places that L could be. L could be over here, or L could be over here. You should notice that if all the numbers in my set are in that part that I've highlighted in orange, then it wouldn't be incorrect to say that this number is also a lower bound. It's just lower than it has to be, because I know M is sufficiently low to be a lower bound for all the numbers in that set. However, this number right here, I can see in the picture, is not really a lower bound for all of the numbers in the set. There are clearly some numbers right here that are above M but below L. Okay, and again, for this to be the greatest lower bound, and the key word there is greatest, it means if there are any numbers greater, they can't really be a lower bound for the set anymore. Okay, what that means is if I picked a number here and I said M is the greatest lower bound, then L can't really be a bound for the entire set. If it was, M wouldn't be the greatest lower bound. L would be, or some number larger than L. 
So as a consequence of this, uh, similar to what we just said in the last case, here's, here's the important upshot for us. If we say M is the greatest lower bound for a set A, and epsilon is some number greater than zero, of course, picture-wise, that means M is here, and let's say M plus epsilon is right there, then what we're saying is if this is the greatest lower bound, there can't be any lower bounds for the set that are larger than that. That means this number cannot be a lower bound. What does it mean for that to not be a lower bound? It means the set cannot be all up here. There would have to be some of it in here. That means there's at least some x in here, which is above m, but less than m plus epsilon. So we could say there is at least some x from our set, such that x is less than m minus epsilon. So putting these two together, uh, I think this is the picture you would have in mind. If that's the number line, and I'm saying that this is an upper bound for a set, and I'm saying this is a lower bound for a set, let's say I further tell you that this is the least upper bound for a set, and I tell you this is the greatest lower bound for a set then if I give you any small number, no matter how small, so picture that as a very, very small number, then if I look at u minus epsilon, and I look at l plus epsilon, putting those two things together that I just showed you says what? There have to be numbers in the set, from the set A, that are in here and in here. That means there has to be some x from the set such that x is less than l plus epsilon, and there has to be some number in the set such that x is greater than u minus epsilon. So I'm picturing there has to be some x here, there has to be some y here. Now when I say some x or some y, there may very well be infinitely many numbers in there, but we're claiming there has to be at least one. Okay, for us, this is the most important consequence of the concept of least upper bounds and greatest lower bounds. Now we come to the famous axiom of completeness. Okay, without getting into a, a metaphysical conversation here, it'll suffice to say that when I use the word axiom, uh, similar to what you may have seen when you studied high school geometry. An axiom is something that I assume a priori. That is, it's not a theorem that I've proven. Um, it would be equivalent, I guess, in our minds to assuming that uh, 1 equals itself. That's, that's an assumption we make. It's an axiom that we make. It's not a statement that can be proven. It's a basic assumption we have to make in mathematics. Okay, the axiom of completeness is one of these important assumptions we make in mathematics. Now, if you go and study advanced calculus, there are a couple of other axioms that are equivalent to the axiom of completeness. And it turns out that if you assume any one of those axioms, you can actually prove the other ones. But the catch is you're going to have to assume one of the axioms to build up a lot of the structure we have in calculus. And so in most advanced calculus books, the one that's usually assumed is the axiom of completeness. And so the axiom of completeness says the following. It says that every non-empty set of real numbers that has a lower bound also 
must have a greatest lower bound. Similarly, if the set is bounded above, there must be a least upper bound. So the axiom of completeness simply says if I have a set of real numbers that's bounded, let's say, above and below, then I must have a least upper bound and a greatest lower bound as well. All right, again, this is not something to be proven or to be delved into any further in this class, but we are going to use the axiom of completeness in the big theorem that we've been headed toward, which is next. So let's move to the next page. And we come to the really the big theorem of the section. A bounded monotonic sequence must converge. Okay, so if the set is bounded and it is monotonic, meaning the sequence is decreasing strictly or increasing strictly, then the theorem says that sequence must converge. Proof. Suppose a sub n is a sequence which is bounded above and increasing. So if I think about that for a minute, if I said that a sequence was bounded above, then if this was, let's say, the line y equals m, let's say m is an upper bound for this set. That means when I start plotting points in this sequence, so let's say this is a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, Notice I'm drawing it so that those y values are increasing because we said this was an increasing sequence. And I'm also drawing in the picture that there's this boundary line because we're saying there is an upper bound for this sequence. So intuitively it should make sense to you that if the elements in this sequence are increasing in value but there is an upper bound, eventually I might run out of room and be forced to get closer and closer to this value of m. Now it does depend on whether that m is the least upper bound or just an upper bound. And we'll get to that here in the proof. So suppose we have our sequence. Suppose it's bounded above. Suppose that it's increasing. Then of course by the axiom of completeness there is a least upper bound, say b. So b is the least upper bound on the sequence, i.e., okay, let's write down what that means. It means that a sub n is less than or equal to b for all n values. Let's make that number one. And what number two, if a sub n is less than or equal to, let's say, u for all n in the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., then we know b would have to be less than or equal to u. Again, if b is the least upper bound, it is the smallest possible upper bound that covers the entire sequence. Any other upper bound would have to be larger than b because b is supposed to be the least of all upper bounds. Okay, so let's go back to the picture we had a little while ago. Let's say this is b. And let's say I pick some small epsilon and I look at b minus epsilon. Okay, if b is the least upper bound, 
then that means when I come down to this lower number, what can I conclude? In this little interval, there must be some numbers from that sequence. There has to be at least one. Let's say there is at least one, and let's call it A sub capital N. So what I'm saying there is given epsilon greater than zero, there must be some n, let's say, such that the number a sub n, that is a sub cap n, which is the cap nth number in this sequence, is greater than b minus epsilon. Now just to turn that around, of course that's the same thing as saying a sub n is greater than b minus epsilon. Now what else do I know? I know that capital B is an upper bound for the set. So of course that means a sub n is also less than or equal to cap B simply because B is an upper bound for the sequence, which of course is less than B plus epsilon. So what I've got now is that a sub n is trapped between B minus epsilon and B plus epsilon. And I should be saying cap n right there. Now, there's one important thing we haven't used yet, which is what? That the sequence was increasing. We said let's assume bounded above, and let's assume increasing. Okay, notice an important consequence of that assumption. Since a sub n is an increasing sequence, That means a sub n plus 1, that's a sub cap n plus 1, a sub cap n plus 2, and so on. All of these numbers are larger than a sub n. And we already know that a sub n itself is greater than b minus epsilon. So now I have b minus epsilon is less than a sub n. And I know all of these numbers after a sub n in the sequence, a sub n plus 1, a sub n plus 2, and so on, are all larger than a sub n, which means they're all greater than a sub n, but less than b. So if you wanted to write that out, I guess we could say the following. We could say that a sub n is less than a sub n plus 1 is less than a sub n plus 2 forever following the rest of the sequence, but of course all of those are less than or equal to b because b is an upper bound, and b is still less than b plus epsilon. Putting that together, I think we can say this. We can say that b minus epsilon is less than a sub n is less than b plus epsilon, and now I do want to make that a lowercase n for n greater than or equal to cap n. Meaning what? For n greater than or equal to cap n, a sub n minus b is less than epsilon. Okay, isn't that the same thing as saying the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals b? because we've shown that for sufficiently large n values we can make the numbers in our sequence as close as we want to b. So in particular what have we shown here? We've shown that the sequence must converge which is what we were trying to show here in this theorem and we've actually along the way showed what the limit has to be. The limit of the sequence actually has to be the least upper bound of the sequence. Meaning, if this sequence is increasing and bounded above, the limit will exist and the limit will be that least upper bound. Similarly, if our sequence is decreasing and bounded below, it must also converge.
it will converge to the greatest lower bound of that sequence. And we're guaranteed that it's going to exist by that axiom of completeness. Okay, so short and to the point, this theorem says that if your sequence is increasing and bounded above, it will converge. And it will converge to the least upper bound of the sequence, whatever that is. If your sequence is decreasing and bounded below, it will also converge and it will converge to the greatest lower bound of that sequence. A corollary of this theorem, and so I won't prove this here, it follows from this theorem we just proved, but it is a, a slightly different theorem in what it says. Uh, the theorem would say that any sequence that is convergent and monotonic must also be bounded. Uh, just to make sure you understand the difference between this corollary and the theorem that we just proved, the boundedness theorem that we just proved, the big one, said that if your sequence was monotonic, and bounded and in the proper direction, so increasing and bounded above or decreasing and bounded below, that that sequence had to be convergent. Notice this theorem is saying that if the sequence is monotonic and convergent, then it is bounded. So the logic is definitely very different there. The big difference is here I'm assuming monotonic and bounded, and that implies that I'm convergent. In this corollary, I'm assuming that I'm monotonic and convergent, and then that implies that the sequence is bounded. Okay, it's a fairly tedious delta epsilon definition, which I'll, I'll pass on here in this video. Uh, we won't need this one very much, but uh, if it comes up, it's a very simple consequence, really, of this previous theorem. But understand now that you have two different things, two different implications. Increasing or decreasing and bounded above or below <clears throat> means you're convergent. Increasing or decreasing and convergent means you must be bounded. That's the two implications we have. So I'd like to look at two examples here at the end. Uh, these are a little bit harder problems, uh, and I just want you to see examples of each of these. In particular, this first one, uh, if you refer to the margin in section 8.1 near the last part of the section, there is a list in the margin of what he calls some common limits, some common sequences with limits. And you can actually use L'Hopital's rule to verify most of them. Uh, but one of the last ones in that list is this limit. He claims that the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence x to the n over n factorial is zero. And he says that this limit formula is true for all real x. So no matter what that x value is, um, if I have, let's say, x equals 1, then we're talking about 1 over n factorial, and that's a fairly common sequence. If I was talking about x equals 2, we'd be talking about 2 to the n over n factorial. But even if that x was, let's say, 1,000, which would give us 1,000 to the n over n factorial, um, you start to see the importance of this limit. Um, if we're saying each of these limits is 0, as n approaches infinity, uh, the bell that should be ringing is definitely one about relative rates of growth. And what we're saying is that it would appear that if I compare any exponential growth function, like 2 to the n or 1,000 to the n, 
to the basic factorial function. These limits of 0 tell us that the factorial function is the larger growing function. It has the larger relative rate of growth. Um, similarly, we're saying that if x is a negative number, so for example, if x was negative 1, this would be negative 1 to the n over n factorial. Um, if x was negative 2, notice that would be negative 2 to the n over n factorial, which would actually be negative 1 to the n times 2 to the n over n factorial. So notice that sequence at the end there is the same as the sequence we just described up here. It's just that I've inserted this little factor that creates an alternation in sign, which is all that factor does. So what I'm saying is the numbers in this sequence are the same as the numbers in this sequence, except they're alternating in sign. But the claim is that for all these different values of x, it won't matter. This sequence, that is a sub n equals x to the n over n factorial, has a limit of 0, regardless of what x is. OK, so let's tear this one apart. So we're looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. Once we verify this limit, this is a formula we'll be able to use any time we want. So the important thing to remember here is that, let's just say remember, x is some fixed number. So for the purposes of this limit, x is a constant. Notice n is going to infinity, so that means in this limit, it's not x that's changing, it's n. So x is a constant, and since it's a, not a constant, we can definitely choose n large enough so that x over n is less than 1. Um, if nothing else, we can just make n x plus 1. In other words, if we make that denominator big enough, bigger than x, we can make that ratio less than 1. So we're guaranteed we can do that. So now let's take that x to the n over n factorial. And of course, we recall that n factorial just means 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 up to n minus 1 times n. In other words, it's the product of the first n natural numbers from 1 up to n. And obviously that 1 doesn't really do anything in our product, but if we include that 1, it is convenient to do so because it gives us exactly n factors. So what I have here are n factors of x in the top, and then the bottom, this product, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 up through n. Okay, assuming that we've surpassed the big N, that is, assuming that N is larger than this big N that we talked about up here, then of course I could say that that bottom looks like 1 times 2 times 3 up to that N. But then of course if N is bigger than an N, there would be some more in that factorial. There would be the next number, and then the next one, all the way up to n. And of course, n and the number just before it. And of course, obviously, I'm suggesting that we should think about that product and this product. And actually, I want to include the n plus 1. So let's say the green and the orange. So let's see here. Let's erase this. Now I'm going to do a little estimation here. This expression I have here on the right, um, I can definitely make that expression smaller by doing one of two things. 
either making the numerator, I'm sorry, I can make that expression bigger. That's what I mean here. I can make this expression bigger by either making this numerator bigger or by making this denominator in the bottom smaller. So let's keep the top the same. So I'm going to copy down the x to the n. The part I have shaded in green, the 1 times 2 times 3 up through the cap n, notice that that's just cap n factorial. So that means I am not changing this part, and I'm not changing this part. Now if I really want to make this expression bigger, and I'm not changing the x and the n, and I'm not changing the cap n factorial, then that means the only other way to do it would be to take this part and make that smaller. Okay, now, question. When I look at that product, n plus 1 times n plus 2 down to n minus 1 times n, the question I would ask you is how many factors are there? And to help you see the answer to that, let's suppose I filled in the rest that's missing, which is the 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 up through the n. That's that n factorial. Well, you do see that right here I have n factors because there's one, two, three, four, dot, 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 n different factors there. When I remove these green ones, which I know is n factorial, notice that that part has n factors. That means the part in red that I'm asking about must have n minus n factors. That is lowercase n minus uppercase n. Okay, question. If I have n plus 1 times n plus 2 all the way up to n minus 1 times n, and notice in that product this is the smallest number and this is the largest. Okay, what's an easy way I could make that entire product smaller? Well, I could replace every single factor in this product by something I know is less than or equal to each of those numbers. So for example, would it be fair to say that n plus 1 times n plus 2 all the way up to n minus 1 times n is less than or equal to n plus 1 to the n minus n? If there are this many factors in this product and I replace all n minus n of those factors, with the smallest of those factors, then that product would definitely be smaller. And I have my inequality going the wrong way there, don't I? That should be, that should be a greater than. I've just made this product smaller by replacing every factor in this product on the left with the smallest of all of the factors, which is the n plus 1. What would be even smaller than that would be n to the n minus n because capital N is less than n plus 1. All right, putting that all together, I think what we can say is that n plus 1 times n plus 2 all the way up to n minus 1 times n is definitely greater than or equal to capital N to the n minus n. And of course, this thing right here is what I have right here in the denominator of this fraction. And again, if I'm trying to make this thing bigger, one way to do that is to make the denominator smaller. And we are saying that this is smaller than this. That means I should be able to replace this part up here by something smaller. And now I know that n to the lowercase n minus uppercase n is smaller. Let me
me erase this stuff. Okay, what does that get me? Well, let's write down what we've got so far. Just to summarize, we've got that x to the n over n factorial is less than or equal to x to the n over cap n factorial times cap n to the lower n minus upper n. Let me do a little algebra and multiply top and bottom of this by capital N to the capital N. So capital N copies of capital N. All right, what does that give me? In the top, it gives me x to the n times n to the n, obviously. In the bottom, I have n factorial times. Now what happens when I multiply these two together? They're the same base, so I add the exponents. And of course, when I take n to the n minus n times n to the n, I get n to the n minus cap n plus cap n, which means I get capital N to the lowercase n. Okay, notice what that gives me. If I put these two together, putting those together gets me x over cap n to the lowercase n times the other two, which would be n to the n over n factorial. Now, we've just done something uh, pretty strange here. We've got an estimate on our original function that it's less than or equal to this thing. Notice what this part is. That part right there is just a constant. Capital N is just some constant, so big N to the big N is a constant, and factorial is a constant. This whole thing is just a constant. Okay, disregarding that constant, what do I know about the limit as N goes to infinity of X over cap N raised to the little n? If this big N itself was chosen so that X over cap N is less than 1. What happens when you take something that's less than 1 and you raise it to the nth power and then you let n go to infinity? Well, we know that limit is 0. Think of this interior part as being like a fraction, like 1 half. If I raise that to a larger and larger positive integer power, I'm going to get something smaller and smaller and smaller. We know that limit is 0. Of course, if the limit of this part's zero and this part's a constant, then that product still goes to zero. All right, so here's what we've got putting this all together. We've got that x to the n over n factorial is less than or equal to x over cap n to the lowercase n times this strange constant. And what else do I know about x to the n over n factorial? Well, if we assumed just for a minute that x was positive, let's assume x is positive, then I could definitely say that this is greater than 0. Now, what should that make you think of? If I take the limit of this part as n goes to infinity, it's obviously 0. If I take the limit of this part as n goes to infinity, we just show that that's also 0. And we know that if the sandwich theorem applies to continuous real value functions, it's also going to apply to sequences. So we can apply the sandwich theorem here. If the limits of these two surrounding expressions are both 0 as n goes to infinity, then that means the limit as n goes to infinity of this guy is also 0. Okay, I won't go through all the technical details, but what would happen if x was less than 0? Then, of course, that means x to the n over n factorial would be less than 0, and then all of these values would be negative, and they would be on the other side. And then when I took the limits, I would still get this expression being trapped between two things, both of whose limits were 0. And so in either case, whether x is positive or x is negative, what we've just proven here with lots of gory detail is that the limit 
as n approaches infinity of any x to the n over n factorial will always be zero, meaning n factorial, n, yeah, n bacterial, n factorial always grows faster than any power of x. Not just small powers, but even larger powers of x. The factorial function is always going to be the faster growing function when compared to power terms or power functions. So just remember this in upcoming sections when you encounter limits like this. If you run into something like limit as n goes to infinity of 2 to the n over n factorial, you're going to automatically be able to say 0 because we've proven this theorem here. Okay, I'd like to take the last part of the video to just uh, briefly talk about uh, one other side road and the study of sequences. It's not something we're really going to look at in here, uh, but it's something I should mention just for completeness and so that when some of you, uh, especially those of you that are going to study computer science, when you see this again, uh, you, you at least have the idea implanted. So what I want to talk about just briefly is recursive sequences. So as an example, let's think about this sequence. Suppose I told you a sub 1 was 1, a sub 2 was 1, a sub 3 was 2, a sub 4 was 3, a sub 5 was 5, a sub 6 was 8. Let's do one more. Let's say a sub 7 is 13. And of course, as you look at the numbers that I'm using to define this sequence, uh, the 1, the 1, the 2, the 3, the 5, the 8, the 13, if you haven't spotted it already, then when you look at it for another minute, something may jump out at you. Um, how does 13 relate to 8 and 5? How does 8 relate to 5 and 3? Well, of course, when you look at those numbers, it starts to become clear that 13 is the sum of 8 and 5. 8 is the sum of 5 and 3. 5 is the sum of 3 and 2. 3 is the sum of 2 and 1. And so now you get the idea of what I mean by recursive. I'm defining the elements or numbers in this sequence in terms of sequence numbers, other sequence numbers. And that's the nature of recursion. Um, in fact, if I called this one, let's say, a sub n, what would this preceding number in the sequence be? It would be a sub n minus 1. What would this number in the sequence be? That would be the one that precedes a sub n minus 1 which would be a sub n minus 2. And if I just extrapolate a little bit here, if it looks like this one is the sum of the two that came before it, it looks like we're saying a sub n is the sum of the sequence number that came before it and the one that came before that. And so really this is the typical way that we, we see a recursive sequence described we see what we call a recursive equation or a recursion and that's simply an equation that describes one number in a sequence in terms of other numbers in the sequence. Now two things if I wanted to calculate numbers in the sequence for example if I wanted to know a sub 8 it means I would have to know a sub 7 and a sub 6 but of course how do I determine a sub 7? I have to know a sub 6 and a sub 5. How do I determine a sub 6? I have to know a sub 5 and I have to know a sub 4. Meaning, to get to a sub 8, I have to unfold a sub 7, a sub 6, all the way down to eventually a sub 1. Meaning, I'm going to have to define some initial condition 
or some initial number values in the sequence. Because if I keep unfolding a sub 8 in terms of a sub 7 and a sub 6, and I keep unfolding, eventually I'm going to get down to the point where my final answer involves a sub 1. And if I don't know what a sub 1 is, this is an undetermined sequence of numbers. So the typical definition I would see for this sequence I've just given you in this example would just be to say that a sub 1 is equal to 1, a sub 2 is equal to 2, and then I would say that a sub n is equal to a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2 for all n greater than or equal to 3. And notice if n is 3, this recursive equation would say a sub 3 is equal to a sub 2 plus a sub 1, which would be 1. And by the way, I do want that to be 1 right there, sorry. This would be 1 plus 1, and that would be 2. Then what would a4 be? I would unfold that in terms of a3 and a2. And of course, a3 we just calculated. And a2 is one of these two initial definitions I gave, which means I get 3. Um, if you've seen this before, then you'll recognize this is the so-called Fibonacci sequence. Um, again, if you're going to study computer science, you're going to see a lot of the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, we're not going to do much with it here other than mention it and just remind you if you have seen it before that this is the defining recursive equation for the Fibonacci sequence. And since this is a sequence, of course, that begs all of the other questions we've just raised about sequences. How do I know if there's a limit? Uh, can I ask questions about whether it's monotonic or bounded and so on? And so if we were going to continue the study of sequences as they pertain to recursive sequences, we could get into all those things. Um, the only thing I want to look at here before we close out, uh, let's look at a couple other examples of recursive sequences just to give you a flavor of what they look like. And then let's go through one example of how we might try to show that a recursive sequence has a limit or is convergent. Uh, so let's look at another famous example of a recursive sequence. It's another one that you've seen before. If I said a sub 1 was 1, and then I said a sub n was n times a sub n minus 1. So this is the initial condition I'm giving you where I'm defining the first number in the sequence. And then here's the so-called recursion equation where you can clearly see I'm defining the nth number in the sequence in terms of the preceding number in that sequence. All right, what would a2 be? Well, according to the formula, if I'm asking for a sub 2, we're saying n equals 2. The formula says that would be 2 times a sub 1, which would be 2 times 1. What's a sub 3? Well, my formula says it would be n, which is 3, times a sub n minus 1, which would be a sub 2. Okay, of course, what is a sub 2? It's what we just calculated right here. Let's do one more just to make sure. What's a sub 4? It would be n, which is 4, times a sub n minus 1, which would be a sub 3. But we just calculated a sub 3 right there, which means this would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. You should certainly by now recognize that this is 4 factorial, this is 3 factorial, and this is 2 factorial. And now that you see that, it makes perfect sense that the factorial function actually produces a recursive sequence. How do you get from 4 factorial to 5 factorial? Well, I know this is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. I know this is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. Well, that 5 factorial has 4 factorial built into it. So how do I get to 5 factorial? I take 5 
which is my n times 4 factorial, which is the factorial of the preceding number. Okay, so a well-known recursive sequence, and if you take an introductory programming course at some point, uh, when you first start talking about recursion, uh, this sequence might be the very first one you start talking about because it's so simple and easy to understand. Okay, so a couple of examples of recursive equations. Let's look at one more now that's a, a little more involved. And this is the last example I want to look at. So let's look at the sequence x of 1 equals 1. So I'm defining the initial value in the sequence. And then my recursive equation is going to be x of n plus 1 equals the square root of 1 plus x of n. And that would be for n equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. Uh, let's calculate a few values just to get a sense of, of what these look like as, as actual numbers when calculated. So let's see, of course we have x sub 1 equals 1, so that's when n equals 1. When n equals 2, our recursive equation says that x sub 2 would be equal to the square root of 1 plus x sub 1. So that means x sub 2 would be the square root of 2, so about 1.414. Um, if n is 3, we're asking what's x sub 3. Of course, when this index value is 3, that means n is actually 2. That means this side should be the square root of 1 plus x sub 2, which would be the square root of 1 plus the square root of 2. If you calculate that, that's about equal to 1.55. Let's do one more. x sub 4 would be the square root of 1 plus x sub 3, which is the square root of 1 plus x sub 3. x sub 3 is this, so that would be the square root of 1 plus the square root of 2. If you calculate all of that, you come up with about 1.59. Now at this point, if the problem I was working on was to try and make a conjecture about what this sequence is doing, I already have a couple of ideas. Um, number one, and seemingly the most obvious, is when I look at these sequence values, they do look like they're increasing. And so my guess is that maybe this is an increasing sequence. Uh, what else do I notice? I notice that as these first few values are increasing, it looks like that rate of increase is slowing down. Okay, and that is also consistent with the possibility that there is a limit. Um, of course, what does that make me think of? If I know I have a sequence that's increasing and it's slowing down, that hints that there could be an upper bound and if the sequence is increasing and bounded above, my big theorem about convergence and bounded sequences says that there would be a least upper bound and that the limit of that sequence would exist and it would be that least upper bound. All right, so the conjecture is just from trying some numbers that it's increasing. If I want to use this theorem, what's the other thing that I need to know? I need to know for sure that this is bounded above. If I had those two things, then my theorem that says when a sequence is increasing and bounded above, it's convergent would apply. All right, so I'm going to show you how to prove those things for a sequence like this one. So let's start actually with showing that it's bounded above. Now, there's a bit of guesswork here, and a bit of randomness, but if I were to calculate a few more values, uh, even if I went up to n equals 100, I would soon see that these numbers in this list never go above 1.7 something. I'll just leave that vague for the minute. Okay, which means if these numbers are increasing 
and they're slowing down in their rate of increase. And if I calculate more of them, it doesn't seem like they ever go above, say, 1.8. Uh, I'm going to be very liberal and say that my guess is that this sequence is bounded above by 2. Now, is that the least upper bound necessarily? Uh, probably not, but I'm just picking a convenient upper bound, some upper bound that seems fairly obvious to me from just looking at the pattern and the numbers. So my two conjectures now are that the sequence is increasing and that it's bounded by two. And I just pick the two because it's a nice, easy number that looks like it's clearly bigger than all the numbers in this sequence. Okay, so the first thing I want to try and prove is that this sequence is bounded above by 2. I'm going to do that by induction. If you recall how induction works, if I'm trying to prove a statement that depends on the natural numbers, and of course, Mathematical induction is the perfect tool for proving things about sequences because the domain of a sequence is the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And if you remember how math induction works, first I have to establish that the claim is true for some base case. Uh, in fact, it would be great if it was true for n equals 1. Once I show that, the next part is to show that if it's true for n, it must be true for n plus 1. If I can show that generally, then having shown it's true for 1 would mean that it must be true for 2. And if it's true for 2, it must be true for 3. If it's true for 3, it must be true for 4. That's what this would give me. So the first thing I want to do is establish that a sub n is bounded above by 2 for some base case. Well, when n equals 1, I know a sub 1 is 1, which is definitely less than 2. And I really only need one base case, so that's far enough. But obviously, if I write down the second one, um, that is clearly also bound above by 2. But it's sufficient to stop right here at this first one. So now I know that this is true for n equals 1. Now let's assume that a sub n actually let's uh, just say a sub n let's assume a sub n is bounded for some n well obviously that's a safe assumption because I just proved or verified that it's true for n equals 1 so obviously it's true for some n but here I'm saying, let's just assume it's bounded for some generic n. What I want to show now is that this assumption has to imply that a sub n plus 1 is bounded. Well, let's see. What is a sub n plus 1? Uh, going back to our sequence, now I switched the letter to, to a on you, but it was originally x. But I know from my definition above here that a sub n plus 1 is the square root of 1 plus x sub n. Okay, what did I just assume about a sub n? I assumed that it's bounded for that n value. And I keep switching to my x's and my a's. So let's switch that one to an a. Okay, that means I am assuming that this a sub n right here is bounded above by 2. Okay, if I make that assumption, then this is less than 1 plus 2, which is the square root of 3, which is definitely less than 2. Therefore, by making the assumption that a sub n is bounded by 2, that automatically led to the conclusion that the next number in the sequence also has to be bounded above by 2. Now, if I put that all together, what does the principle of math induction say? I showed that for n equals 1, that this claim is true. That is, a sub n is bounded by 2, because we verified that a sub 1 
was 1, which was less than 2. Now in this part, I've proved that if it's true for n, it's true for n plus 1. Well, that means if a sub 1 is bounded by 2, so is a sub 2. And if a sub 2 is bounded for, by 2, so is a sub 3. And so by the principle of math induction, which of course produces this domino effect, I've shown that they're all less than 2 now. Okay, so now that I've got this sequence bounded above, to use my big theorem, I need to show that it's an increasing sequence. So I'll stick with A's here instead of X's. So there's my sequence, and now what I want to show is that this sequence is increasing. Okay, let's verify that the claim is true for n equals 1. Okay, what would it look like for n equals 1? Well, let's see. n equals 1 means a sub 1 would be 1, and a sub 2 would be the square root of 1 plus a sub 1, which would be the square root of 2. So, of course, if n is 1, which is this guy right here, then I'm saying that a sub 1 is definitely less than a sub 2. So for those two values, it looks like I have an increasing sequence. And since I'm saying a sub n is less than a sub n plus 1 here, when n equals 1, I have verified that this is an increasing sequence when n is 1. All right, that's the base case. Now what I'm going to do is assume in general that a sub n is less than a sub n plus 1. What I want to show based on that assumption is that this statement is true for n plus 1. That is, I want to show that a sub n plus 1 is less than a sub n plus 2. And basically what have I done there? I've replaced these n's by n plus 1's. And you can see how this is going to work. If these are the numbers in my sequence, and I can show that in general, any time I take two consecutive numbers in the sequence, this one has to be smaller than this one, then if I can show that in general for n, then it must be true for n plus 1. That's the thing I'm going to show. Well, if it's true for n plus 1, that means this one will be smaller than the next one. And this one will be smaller than the next one. And then from there on, I've produced the domino effect again, and I've got an increasing sequence. All right, so how to do it, how to prove it. So that's easy. I've assumed that a sub n is less than a sub n plus 1. Let's add 1 to both sides. All right, now, here's the thing. Why, why am I going to do that? So over here on the side, let's do a little scratch work. And this is the part where you'd be uh, doodling to figure out where to go with this. Think about the thing you're trying to prove. Think about trying to prove a sub n plus 1 is less than a sub n plus 2. Okay, what is the definition for a sub n plus 1? Well, our original formula says that would be the square root of 1 plus a sub n. What's a sub n plus 2? Well, our definition says that a sub n plus 2 is equal to the square root of 1 plus the number in the sequence before that, the square root of 1 plus a sub n minus 1. If I squared both sides of that, I'd have 1 plus a sub n less than 1 plus a sub n plus 1. If I subtracted 1 from both sides, I'd have a sub n less than a sub n plus 1 which is precisely what I'm assuming here. I'm assuming that a sub n is less than a sub n plus 1, and now I'm going to try and show that this statement is still true when I replace those n's by n plus 1's, which is this one. And from my scratch work, I can see that I can easily get from here to here by just reversing these steps. So I'm starting with my assumption 
I'm going to add one to both sides. Then what am I going to do? I'm going to take the square root. And these are all true so far based on this assumption. Now, by definition, what is this thing on the left side of the equation? It is simply a sub n minus 1. By definition, what is this thing on the right side of the equation? That's a sub n plus 2. And so now, by assuming a sub n is less than a sub n plus 1, I've easily reached the implication that a sub, and that should be a sub n plus 1, is less than a sub n plus 2. Therefore, when the claim is true for n, it is necessarily true for n plus 1. Therefore, by math induction, we've shown that this sequence is increasing. Okay, that's great. It's increasing, and it's bounded above. I don't necessarily know what the least upper bound is, though. If I knew what that least upper bound is, that would be my answer. Okay, but I loosely assume 2, which I'm pretty sure is not the least upper bound. Okay, that's easy. Let's go back to a sub n plus 1 equals the square root of 1 plus a sub n. Now that we know this sequence exists, we know the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals something. There is a limit. Okay, notice that if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1, that's going to be the same limit. The only difference between these two is that one of them has just shifted one spot to the right or left in the sequence. Overall, this list of numbers, this sequence of numbers, is still going to that same value. It doesn't matter if I'm off one either way. Overall, the limits of these two sequences are the same. In other words, there's no difference between the sequence a sub n and a sub n plus 1 other than where they start. Now, they are different sequences in that if you write them out, this one's going to be a1, a2, a3, and so on. And this one's going to be a2, a3, a4, and so on. So don't get me wrong. They're definitely completely different sequences. But the limits are going to be the same. Okay, if that's true, that means when I take the limit as n goes to infinity of both sides of this equation, I know the limit on this left side exists. And I know the limit on this right side also exists. And if I solve that equation, which is quadratic, I can actually solve that quadratic and determine an answer. And I'll let you verify this. If you do solve that, you're going to get L equals 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. Okay, of course, I know that all of these sequence numbers are positive because they started at 1 and they increased and they were bounded above by 2. That means I'm going to dismiss the negative one. That doesn't really apply. The limit of this sequence is 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, which is about 1.61. Okay, now just remember this: uh, these last couple pages where I've been talking about recursive sequences, uh, that's for your edification in particular if you're going to study computer science. It's not really something we're going to delve into in this class. It's just here for... Uh, comprehensiveness, uh, that's a good place to stop. Definitely enough talked about so far.